there, there are three projects, in particular Hugh Jungson's PhD uh, and these two create projects, both of which involve interdisciplinary teams. And it seems to me that these issues require interdisciplinary investigation. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about business models, but with some anxiety because we have one of the foremost scholars in this field uh, 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 who's going to close. But uh, it seems to me that we talk a lot about business models, but there isn't a, a, a single accepted definition about what a business model is. Every firm has to have one, um, but, but, but the business model is conflating a number of different things. For example, it's partly a, a, a retrospective, descriptive representation of reality as it is, of the practices of a business? Or is it a prospective, normative idea of how we will create a new business? Those two are rather different things, and yet they're conflated together. And there's also some dilemma about whether it's representing kind of the firm strategy. Is it a kind of pump for extracting value from the consumer? Or is it a description about the firm's relationship with an ecosystem? Uh, and it seems to me actually it's used in all of those ways, uh, and, and that is probably why it's an interesting topic, but a difficult topic to, to handle. Uh, and the traditional approach of strategic management uh, was, that, was, was, was that management was a matter of rational calculation, and so you have calculative models of business model, cal calculative views. Uh, and, uh, and I'm concerned about that. Uh, and I think there has been a kind of counter strand within the business schools, people like Mintzberg, who looked at the internal organizational politics by which management strategy emerges and how management strategy emerges as a process of conflict and struggle, as, as, as well as a process of calculation. Um, uh, but more recent work by uh, colleagues in the Col de Mine, uh, Centre for Sociology de Innovation, uh, Doganova, Lillian Doganova, looks at the work that business models do, that the circulation of business models uh, uh, as boundary objects, objects that are meaningful to multiple different audiences, that the circulation of business models is the way that firms attract investment capital and maybe constitute new markets. So here is a different approach to business models as a business model as, as, a, as, a, as a device for a certain kind of creation of a certain new world. So different approaches are possible. Now, these kind of dis discussions are quite key when we think about business models in the digital economy. We have a situation characterised, as the introduction to this session says, about rapid change in technology and in industry stru structure and, above all, in consumer behaviour. And we don't have validated models for how uh, new businesses in the digital economy will work. There's a lack of evidence. And I would argue that you cannot apply traditional planful models in such a turbulent context because many of the key evidences and paradigms are not yet in place. So, so one could instead talk about how visions about new businesses are, are created and how they're disseminated and how they're consumed. Um, uh, and one, one can also talk, and what I'll be talking about, is learning by doing. Since you cannot... Uh, uh, be sure that new business models, new propositions, new service models will survive. A lot of these things have to be done by launching things and trying them out in the field, in the real market, finding out whether, in particular, whether real consumers will sign up. And in that context, we see a particular approach to innovation in the digital economy based upon a proliferation of startups, many of which fail, uh, some of which succeed, have to be reinvented and transformed, uh, and, 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 then, and, then, uh, and then eventually some survive and establish themselves. So, so it seems to me that uh, in, in this context, business models are necessarily incomplete, and work has to be done to, to not only to implement them, but to rework them in the light of changing circumstances. Even launching your own product into the digital economy changes the world, uh, and then you see, you learn about customer behaviour, and your, your, your competitors also will respond. And in this context, we've tried to address this through a perspective we highlight, we call social learning, which looks at the way that the actors involved learn by doing, by this, often by a trial and error process uh, of, of launching and success succeeding or failing. And at a later stage, of course, successful models may become institutionalised and accepted, and they go into the business studies textbooks and the economics textbooks, uh, uh, and then you can topologise them. But at this stage, we think there's a process of emergence that needs attention. Now, these are very relevant to the topic of uh, uh, digital music, uh, and uh, Porter, uh, one of Porter's famous case studies, 
highlights the way the record labels, uh, although they, they, they were interested in digital distribution, they didn't manage to create uh, their own distribution channel, and into that vacuum, Porter says, stepped Apple with its iTunes music store, which seemed to resolve the problem after peer-to-peer -peer file sh sharing existed. It seemed to resolve the problem of how to valorize digital music. And so Porter emphasizes this, and he shows how the, the, the entrenched players, by failing to, 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 to anticipate the need for this new uh, uh, intermediary, had allowed uh, a new gatekeeper to emerge. Now, what's interesting about this case is that, as Hyo Jung Sung's uh, PhD shows, that by the time Porter wrote this, it was already, his conclusion was already, if not already obsolete, the conditions for making it obsolete were already underway uh, because a range of startup firms had been experimenting with different kind of music streaming services where instead of buying and download, you, 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 you hire music uh, and, and gain it at a much lower uh, rental cost. Uh, and we saw firms like Last FM, which seemed to succeed and paled into insignificance, and in particular we saw Spotify emerging as a successful uh, example. Spotify is interesting. It emerges in Sweden, not a coincidence. Why? Sweden was the land of the pirate party. There was no significant licensing stream from music in Sweden. So actually, the record companies weren't particularly worried about letting this trial go ahead in, in that context. Uh, but it, it proves a success, it internationalizes, uh, uh, and, and, and it establishes a model for valorizing music based upon subscription services as well as free and freemium services. So uh, it now has 100 million users. It has 30 million paying subscribers. Uh, it doesn't yet make a profit. It is still attracting venture capital because it's still growing very rapidly. But it, is, it seems to represent a stable, a, a, maybe a, a temporary stabilization uh, of the field. So that's, the, that's a, 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 the Western solution, which I won't, you will know a bit about it, so I won't go on long about it. But, uh, we've just come back from, uh, uh, Xiaobei Shen and I have just come back from uh, uh, opening periods, uh, pieces of field work in our study of, of new models of digital distribution in music and other sectors in China. And there you have a radically different situation. You have half a billion people using the internet and downloading f music for free. Uh, it can't be in one minute. Okay. Um, but, but here we see uh, the internet giants uh, are locked into a battle to buy up exclusive access to music. Why is that possible? Exclusive access. Well, it's possible because in China, the record companies are weak. The internet companies are strong. They have huge pockets. And they're engaged in a battle to do grab land as much of the ter territory as they can. Uh, uh, and they don't yet have a way of valorizing that, of creating income from it. They're giving that music away free. So we looked at Tencent, who have a uh, message messaging service. They built digital music streaming as an extension of that. And they have now a few million users on a subscription service. Uh, the subscription service, people do that because they can get access to downloads of early music, and they can get free uh, entrance to uh, uh, concerts, etc., etc. Merchandise is sold with it. So Tencent is beginning to do that. Tencent starts signing up Japanese, Korean, and some Western content. In return, the e-commerce giant Alibaba feels it has to respond. It now starts buying as much musical content as it can because it fears being locked out. And it's set up an Ali, a system called Ali Planet. Again, some people may, pay, may buy their subscription service, but, but it thinks it can valorize selling services to creators to distribute and market their cultural content online. So it will use its e-commerce income streams as a way of subsidizing and valorizing its music systems. So it seems to me, and this is the final slide you'll be pleased to know, um, you know here we see the, the developments of digital music are strongly patterned by the structural context in each country and the history of each country. Sharp differences between China and the West uh, have been uh, revealed in the way that digital music's unfolded. There are similarities, however, in particular, uh, 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 protracted processes of collective experimentation in the context of profound uncertainty. Uh, uh, and the final lesson I'll say is that you can't, therefore, look at these through snapshot studies. You have to look at these as profoundly dynamic processes under continuing and continual change. Uh, and that's good because it keeps academics like me uh, in a job. I'll stop now. So we have some Thank you. Um, this research has focused on the fitness landscape of 
drum production companies in the UK, particularly after 1982, the um, startup of Channel 4, when some thousand new companies were created, independent production companies. And it's going to map, what I'm doing is mapping the influence of regulatory interventions and other factors, technology in particular, on the business models, I'll use that term advisedly, adopted across the sector. So it's a, an historical overview to inform, hopefully, possible future policy objectives. And the quote on the screen gives you the context, basically, particularly the um, uh, sentence, two sentences, um, basically, which are in bold, about the UK's ability to develop great content, but uh, lacking companies of scale. Um, so starting a little bit before 1982, there were five, been five phases of broadcasting in the UK. There was Monopoly, BBC, this is television broadcasting. That was followed by the duopoly from 1955 onwards when um, the ITV system was created, became the cosy duopoly. That lasts through to the um, 82 when Channel 4 starts up, you have market expansion. Then after terms of trade are changed in early 2000s, you have consolidation, lots of acquisitions and takeovers. And now we are in the situation of having global players. All of these are related in different ways to interventions. Um, and all of them in some way have something to do with competition, increasing competition across the period. So it met the beverage report in the early 50s basically recommended that the BBC maintain its monopoly. I mean, John Reith uh, talked about the brute force of monopoly and how it was good for society. There was a minority report by Selwyn Lloyd, and that was, and who subsequently became a conservative minister, and it was that minority report which actually carried through in the foundation of IT. V in 1955. The next significant intervention was the Annan Report in the late 70s. That was based on a, a, a feeling amongst the community that the creative community that they were somehow constrained by being within the cosy duopoly. And a proposal came out for basically a publisher broadcast, the Open Broadcasting Authority. That was converted by the incoming Conservative government into Channel 4, which I detailed before um, in terms of what then led from that. The next um, intervention, in a sense, came from the Peacock Committee, um, which was set up to look at the financing of the BBC, but actually conducted the first really thorough economic analysis of uh, broadcasting in the UK. And it basically looked forward a long way in terms of changing technologies, possibility of satellites, possibility of subscription. But the key thing that came from that was quotas, quotas on the BBC and ITV. So for the first time, those vertically integrated structures, which is what they were, suddenly had to take in outside um, programming. The next key point is the Mon Monopolies and Mergers Commission and the Office of Fair Trading, as they were called in the early 90s, looking at the way ITV operated and basically forcing ITV to only take a, a limited license on programmes. So, Secondary, license, secondary markets became something which could be exploited separately. This was particularly important for the independents, and this was picked up by the Phyllis Report for the ITC in the early 2000s, which strangely, or well, sometimes strangely at all, which basically, I'm, and I'm here quoting, wanted to reduce barriers to overseas investment, resources, and expertise, and their hope was greater efficiency and profitability. The strange thing there was that in the US there had been the, something called the financial syndication uh, rules which operated after the 80s all the way through to the early 90s, um, which basically stopped the networks, which at that time controlled everything in the US, stopped the networks having secondary rights in their material. And that, by the early 90s, was fading out, and the networks uh, re-established control over all programming, the networks were then basically merging with the studios and the American system basically is very much a vertically integrated system again, whereas the UK has a very competitive system. Next stage, tax reliefs and now we have new players. So I suppose the, the summary point on all of that is that we've had changes and they've been defined increasingly by in competition law, the idea of reducing buyer power in particular. And interestingly, um, this is where the EU became appropriate because one of the things that 
Competition Acts in the UK have adopted is Article 85 of the EU Treaty, um, and which is now Article 81, and that has basically underpinned a lot of these changes, for good or ill. Now, along the way, the finance model, and now we're talking back to post-1982, in the early days, the indep independents were very dependent. They were captive on Channel 4. Um, Channel 4 offered them business advice um, because most of them came out of um, situations where basically they didn't know how to run a business. Uh, gradually that changed. By the early 2000s, they had relations with the um, broadcasters which were more equal, um, particularly after the terms of trade changed, and they then had to be begin to look for gap finance because the broadcasters often only offered them a smaller proportion than 100% of the commissions. And the role of the distributors increased, particularly with the globalization, increasing globalization of the market. We're now in a new phase where the SVOD players, Netflix, Amazon, and so on, are offering basically 100% um, finance, but they want exclusivity. So the terms of trade have become irrelevant for those um, commissions. And this is very much in the drama sector. Um, I should emphasize. Some of this applies for other programming, but as I said at the outset, I focused very much on the drama sector. Now, the firm types that we have now. So we have vertically integrated companies, BBC, ITV Studios. We have super indies, which are the companies which consolidated these smaller companies which had started up all the way through the 80s and 90s. Uh, so they're effectively subsidiaries of, of super indies, like Endemol Shine, like um, Fremantle, like, um, yeah, uh, those two, uh, uh, all three media. Endemol Shine, American Dutch, all three media, American. Um, we have studio subsidiaries, uh, so Carnival, which made Downton Abbey a subsidiary of NBC Universal. Uh, with Sony have a, a subsidiary as well. Then we have what are called true indies, so an independent is defined in legislation as a, under the 1990 Broadcasting Act as a company which had basically less than, in the outset, 15%, now 25% of investment by a broadcaster in the relevant market. So there are, there are what are called true indies. Then there are a new version, which are tied indies. These are independent companies which are being set up with this less than 25% investment, usually to capture some of the what is seen as the proliferation of commissions for drama, particularly for, for the SVOD players. And then we have an interesting uh, group, which are the talent-driven indies, which basically often writer-driven, and writers there are looking for more of the rent, more of the value from a program than they would have got if they just worked with uh, an ongoing independent production company. So the situation is that, whoops, um, basically on the, on the screen you'll see the basically what I'm calling firm density. So these are commissions between 2005 and 2015, and it's sourced from the broadcast green light index, which isn't completely accurate because it includes, um, doesn't include things like continuing series being commissioned and produced by the BBC, like EastEnders Casualty, or by ITV, like Coronation Street. But you can see that basically 100, 199 production companies commissioned over that 11-year period, 107 of them only got one commission. Does that make a business? Um, and I won't read out the figures so I haven't got the time, but you can see also at the bottom, uh, the 10 plus commissions, you have 16 companies got more than 10 commissions, they've clearly got a business, only three of those are true indies. And then we have the figures for BBC um, and some of the major labels of the, um, of the super indies. So what I'm doing, okay, so this long preamble, I'm doing a series of case studies, looking, modeling and reviewing what are called adaptive walks. This is a term coined by a guy named Stuart Kaufman, who basically a, um, uses that for um, evolutionary biology, but it's been adapted by somebody called McKelvey into organizational studies. What I'm finding is the importance of the writer and the writer-producer couplet. Reputation and talent are very important, but often that reputation is built up in one of the duopoly. It's changing a little bit. There's an interview, interestingly, this week in broadcast with the uh, new chief of uh, Kudos, where he's basically talking about developing talent within his company. There's uh, then the whole dependency networks issue, the relationship with commissioning editors. The key thing is, though, that you can learn from failures. So there are foundations and there are failures. What can you learn from failures? You can find out what didn't work. 
And there's one particular example I draw to, actually I draw attention to. One is Zenith, which basically collapsed in 2006, went into liquidation, which had basically had a big, big impact uh, through the 90s, lost its um, major commissions and lost its major staff. And then a company called Box TV, which again was bought by DCD Media, and then basically the major talent left, and the company was effectively ceased to operate. So the key issue I'm looking for is what constitutes sustainable success in the context of that um, context of that document that was um, issued by the Creative Industries Council in 2014. And I suppose the issues there are. Also, there are other issues, policy objectives, I'm going to finish now, public interest against competition, um, what is the situation for the UK when we have one global player, which is basically BBC with BBC Worldwide, um, that against the US vertical integration model, which now has global dominance. And I suppose the three small issues, inward investment, is that very important? How important is reflecting identities? the issue of global markets, and is British TV becoming more like British film? Um, British TV used to be seen as the best in the world. It's now a bit dependent, and perhaps it's going to end up in the same place. I, uh, I was very fortunate to be approached by uh, Create and asked to be uh, um, one of their first um, in industry fellows. And I did... Uh, uh, Philip rang me up and said, would you like to be an industry fellow? And I said... I think I can be an industrious fellow, but I don't really know what an industry fellow is. So uh, anyway, it turned out that I could sort of choose a topic um, to work on. And I thought this was a fantastic opportunity because around that same sort of time, this was about a year and a half ago, sort of early part of last year, um, the, the words blockchain and distributed ledger technologies um, were becoming very hot buzzwords. And um, the thing about it was that every time I talk to anybody about this, because I sort of immediately get excited about new things like this, being a bit of a sort of gadgetry sort of person, um, I, um, I, I found that the more that they tried to explain it to me, the less I understood. So I thought, this is interesting as a phenomenon. Um, uh, maybe I should try and explore that. So that's what I did. Uh, so I spent some time um, interviewing uh, a dozen or so uh, sort of technologists um, music industry people um, and uh, artists and, uh, and various different sorts of folk in the sort of ecosystem of digital music to try and get a sense of what was, all, what was going on. And, and, um, and as it happened, this period coincided with some quite exciting uh, sort of events taking place in, in here in, in London, actually in, in, in other parts of the world as well. Um, so before I go on, though, how many people here, uh, if I talk about blockchain and distributed ledger technology, how many of you feel confident that you know what I'm talking about? Uh, gosh, well, you're the positive and optimistic ones. Um, for the rest of you, let me try and um, I'll give you a, a sort of quick snapshot, I suppose. So uh, essentially, this is a concept of a technology that allows you to make an irrefutable and irre uh, unrepudiatable record of a transaction that's taken place. Uh, and the way that that is done is by using cryptographic puzzles, uh, which are distributed algorithmically to points around a network, uh, which say, if you all find the same answer to this puzzle, then we think that this transaction that we've identified here has happened correctly, if that sort of makes sense. Uh, and that activity of solving those puzzles takes, it takes place on, on computers. And uh, the motivation for solving those problems is the, produce, the production of further cryptographic uh, currency. And this whole system was designed to essentially create cryptocurrencies, that's to say digital currencies that occur and exist within a, uh, a network environment. Um, now, if that made some sense to you and that was helpful to you, I'm glad. If it didn't, then it's okay because, you know, you'll just have to live with, the, with, with the, uh, the ambiguity of it all because, frankly, the ambiguity of it all still continues to exist. Um, the, uh, the, the, the thing about this, I suppose, is that uh, it has extraordinary implications and possibilities and that although uh, this concept began life uh, inside uh, a, a digital currency, Bitcoin, uh, 
the implications and, and a kind of philosophical framework that's elaborated around the notion of distributed technologies of this kind uh, and, and the implications of what you could do if you applied these sorts of ideas not just to currency but to things outside the financial services and indeed potentially to uh, individual identity and in fact to entire states and to the notion of democracy uh, has inspired people to see and to talk about uh, blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology, as something which is, represents almost a new era and a new layer uh, of the internet. Uh, a means by which uh, a degree of certainty and security can be created, a degree by which a certain openness and transparency can be created. Uh, and the extraordinary thing about this, uh, because of its provenance, um, is that it has attracted people uh, both from the financial services field and, and particularly aggressively uh, free capitalist uh, uh, hedge fund owners on the one hand and then on the other hand uh, sort of open democracy idealists and the odd syndico anarchist is probably thrown in there somewhere as well on the other hand and there's an extraordinary uh, uh, phenomenon going on really where these two completely uh, oppositional and, and sort of orthogonal sorts of people uh, are actually collaborating together to try and generate new platforms and, and new business models. Now, it's very interesting that we should be sitting here talking about business models and, and a, a fascinating sort of anatomy. I, I, as a sort of business person, my view is I don't really care what it means. We just use the word and get on and do business. And the model bit, well, fine, you know. But anyway, I understand that there's, you know, there's a use for a, this sort of academic discussion. I, I, probably. Um, anyway, uh, as long as it keeps you in a job, that's the main thing. So, the, but the thing that's extraordinary about it uh, to me, and, and the reason why this uh, to me is very exciting and, and, and I think is, is very significant, not just for music, which is where I focused my research, but also uh, more broadly across content industries, is because of the fact that actually this technology is capable of spawning new business opportunities and new ways of doing business uh, throughout the entire value chain of what we currently think of as, as, as the music industry, for example. So uh, as a way of thinking about that, on one level, one way that one might use some technology like this um, is to simply take the, acknowledge the fact that, and actually let's, let's take a games example rather than a music example, just, just to sort of change it around a bit. In games production, particularly independent games development, you often find that there are all sorts of people who contribute different things to a game as it's being developed. Um, so somebody might do the lighting, and somebody else might do textures, and someone else might write the narrative, and somebody else might be responsible for the interactivity. Now, the, the difficulty in independent creation is very often the fact that those individual participants are, each do their piece of work. Um, they don't necessarily do it under contract to a company. They may not even have been a company formed around this idea yet. And, but at the same time, there's a piece of work that they contributed. And if it were possible to identify a, a set of value around that and to, and to memorialize that, then as the production continues and as value may actually accrete to that particular project, then there's some means of going back and recognizing both the attribution to the contrib contribution that was made, so on the sort of creative side, but potentially value as well. And so that's a, that's a really interesting thought that, you know, somehow we could, that some new form of technology could actually enable something which otherwise was a matter of writing things down on bits of paper which may or may be lost and not necessarily be confirmable and, uh, and, and subject to dispute and so on. Um, now, the interesting thing is that you can then stack that up and start looking at that in, in other areas. So in the music industry at the moment, there are a lot of people looking at what kind of distribution and publishing and distribution platform could be created for independent music creators that would both allow that same kind of payment to all the individual contributors, so all the musicians who recorded a particular track could all be paid in a very automatic, transparent, open and immediate kind of way, and that that in itself may overcome some of the problems of the current infrastructure and architecture, which involves collecting societies who often take six months to, to a year or even longer to distribute monies to people according to what it is that they've earned. Uh, and even then, the basis upon which they've distributed it is very often not open and not transparent. So uh, there are numbers of companies who are starting to look at this and starting to think, yeah, actually, there's a way of doing something here which is uh, a recognition of the value we create and a very immediate and dynamic way of rewarding us and 
and also is open and transparent to everyone, and so there's no arguments. Um, in addition to doing that, the, the opportunity is also there as that, as that moves forward to capture lots of metadata about all the different contributors and all the different pieces, and that that metadata itself starts to serve a purpose uh, for the industry as a whole as you aggregate all of those different pieces and all those different works to provide a new kind of collecting society, a new kind of licensing agency, potentially. So, What's fascinating about this technology, and the reason why it's so exciting, is because it's spawning all of these different thought processes and all of these possible ideas. And that's why there's so much energy around it, because that's not just true in music, it's also true across content and actually across all sorts of other sectors of industry. So um, I've got one minute left, have I? Yeah. Right. What do I say about that then in one minute? So that, I think that's the thing that's most exciting about it. Two thoughts, really, to leave you with. One is, is it ever going to happen, or are we all just sort of, you know, fanning around experimenting. Um, and, I don't, and the answer to that is, I don't know, but I think it's really important that we pursue it and we continue very rigorously to, to explore and to try and demonstrate where value might exist in this kind of environment. Um, and then in the end, does that represent a value to us and does that represent progress? Well, I think certainly if you think about music, I don't share um, Robin's confidence about the uh, streaming model and the fate of Spotify. I think uh, we're seeing some really challenging issues there. And so it seems to me that actually starting to think about what a fully digital architecture not just for music, but for all content could look like, yeah, is a critical mission, actually, and one that we all have to pursue. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here, but also very nervous, because I'm not an expert. I, I come uh, with some knowledge about the debates around business models and digital economy, but not with a level of expertise that resides in this room about the issues of intellectual property, it's in purpose and as on. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, um, on, so I'm not an expert at all about issues around creativity, except I try to be creative, and I try to monetize it, and I try to make it disseminated, but I'm a lay person at the end of this. So um, I, I put that. Um, I, I think this is already great moment to think about business models, because we've actually had two very interesting themes come out of here. Exactly as Robin said, uh, and Charlotte warned you, what on earth is this topic? I mean, at the worst, it's Donald Trump. I mean, let's face it, he goes on TV and he talks about business models and how you have to write business model, and he might be the next president of the United States, and that's a terrifying thought. Um, and, and so business models might be thrust into our agenda in a particular way. But let's stand back from that, that horrible thought and, and think about two ways in which the business model discourse can really help us understand the puzzles of the world. One is that around us, firms are doing things differently from what they did before with customers. And the technology that they use has meant that the same firm with the same name has suddenly appeared to do different things and people have arrived in industries doing different things, be it Google or other things. And, and in that sense, a business model is a discourse about what firms do and how they do those things. And the focus is mainly on firms. And so when we talk about does a firm have a business model, we really might be using the words firm, strategy, business model in sort of almost uh, replaceable ways. And in that sense, you know, Robin really made a great point about if you want to understand the business models in China, you really have to look at Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, who actually have an enormous share of the market and are backing out in a very interesting way and by looking at how they are trying to engage with customers, how they're trying to segment different pieces of the market between search engines, portals, and um, games. Maybe I've got it wrong, but that's my answer. Is that right? That's, that's roughly what the story is. It, 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 it is telling us a lot about the way that technology can be used to come about. And, 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 and in the same way, um, uh, Richard actually told us a history of the industry, which was really a history of different business models. And in particular, the incredible importance of, of, of government legislation, regulation, about how these different 
ways and which kind of firm came about and emerged. And, you know, I think it's fascinating. I wish I had done more research about Red Planet, Hattrick and Hartswood. I mean, you know, I know about Sherlock Holmes because I watch it, but, I mean, that's about my limit of understanding its business model. But, you know, you've got some very interesting plays taking place between firms competing in different ways. But I suggest to you that actually the question that, that, that Jeremy asked is in some ways the really important underlying question, which is, okay, we can look at these firms and how they're competing and what they're doing, but what next? And we need a framework to answer that question. And we need something a little bit more that actually looks forward as opposed to backwards. And, and, and you actually come along saying, this is fantastic technology. How can it be used? And the bottom line of that question is, how can it be monetized? Because if it's not monetized, and someone doesn't get paid for it, it won't get used. That's the bottom line. In order for a technology to be used, it has to be monetized. And in order for a technology to be used, somebody has to use it. And so I put it to you that really the business model is a story about how customers, and in particular consumers, engage and how that engagement leads to monetization. And that actually is no more or less than what a business model is about. The rest of it, about how a firm might organize its value chain or who it might buy, is, of course, a really important question, but has nothing to do with a business model. That's, if you want to be effective at thinking about the answer to a question, you have to focus your energy on one question at a time. That's what we've learned. That's what science tells us. And the question really is about how do we engage with customers and monetize it. And if you think about that question, I mean, the answer is intuitively blindingly obvious, although it's taken me about five years to figure it out. Um, but, but actually, there are two ways that you can uh, engage uh, with customers. You can make a product or service and give it to them and tell them, take it away home and use it and find out a way to use it. So, you know, a tin of baked beans in the supermarket you buy, actually, you have to take it home and do something with it. You have to open it and cook it. Food has to be cooked. Um, videos which you buy in the CD form, you have to take home and, and, and use. And so the consumer is an entrepreneur. That's a piece of the equation that's been left out. The consumer is the entrepreneur. And that's one business model. And another business model is that you go to a rock concert and you are immersed in the experience. And you co-produce and co-consume the enjoyment and the excitement, and that's a completely different business model. And those two business models have profound implications about monetization, because when you co-consume and co-produce, there is no danger you can't charge a fee and capture the value. Every consultant who does work for hire knows that. That's the best way of capturing the creativity, because there is no way it could be stolen from you. You are there, they are there, and you can charge for it. Whether maybe they climb over the fence and don't pay, but that's another matter, right? The, 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 the other way of thinking about the business model is am I a broker or a deliverer? Classic thing in network theory. A deliverer is somebody who has a one to one relationship with the customer. You want something, I engage with you, I give it to you. The broker is someone who says, You want something, I'll find someone else and I'll put you two together. And I either do it in a Jungen's form, which is the guy who says you want some free content and I'll take it off the internet and I'll give it to you for free and I'll steal it off somebody and I'll give it to you for free. Maybe I charge a fee for it or maybe I won't. And the other one says I will be uh, 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 Gardens and I'll keep you apart and I will give you what you need but you won't find the other party. I will get some money from the other party. And that's a classic way that... And don't forget, Google's content do you know the largest part of Google is the marketing department? Do you know what the marketing department does in Google? It doesn't care about people who search. It looks for advertising. If you talk to the people in the marketing department of Google, they'll tell you, you're not allowed to advertise unless you provide content. We are not interested in advertisers who don't provide content. The competitive advantage of Google is not in stealing free content from the web. It's getting content from advertisers which is paid for, which other people can't get. 
That's the competitive advantage. You re bring and pay to original stuff in the, in the actual stuff you write. That's the mechanism of collecting. Now, the point of creativity is making sure that the people who are providing the creative stuff are part of that mechanism. That's why the two-sided business model, which is mediated, is actually both a dangerous business model and a successful business model for creativity. It changes, it tips the balance, it does some things that you don't know about. So can I do in one minute just the slides? So what I'm saying is we put up this web we're just developing. It's called the businessmodelzoo.com, which explains the four different business model types. It's free. Um, it's never going to be monetized except by getting other people to pay for it, not you. I'm not going to sell your data, don't worry. Um, and it's got four different business models. And I just sketched what do I mean the business models here. And, and I'm probably totally wrong, but I'm giving it to you as a way of thinking about the world. That down on the bottom right hand side is a live performance. I went to listen to Mick Jagger many years ago. I paid a lot of money for it. It remains etched in my memory. And I still buy his records as a result, and I don't download it for free. Value by engagement, copying is hard, scaling is hard, monetization doesn't require strong IP. When you sell a CD, copying is easy, scaling is easy, monetization depends on strong IP enforcement. We all know the problem of file sharing, IP rights essential to protect the creative artists, but incredibly difficult to think. I think the interesting one is the one on the top right, mediated markets. Yes, Google is a big source of money. It's also a source of problems. It will be paying for creative content, maybe not quite the one you expected. The question is to negotiate and think about that. Those business models at the moment don't make much money, except for a few of them. They get a lot of money from Silicon Valley, but they don't make a much profit. Somebody said Spotify did. The next generation of those will. The current generation doesn't. The next generation will figure it out. And they, if we are in at the bottom of the elevator and shaping them, might be able to find a better answer of how to keep creativity and find new sources of revenue. Thank you very much. Well, I, I mean, I think the, the thing that's fascinating about that is, of course, that you know, what we see in the marketplace is the playing out of you know, multiple models in conflict with one another. Correct. So, yes. you know, this isn't a, a, a you know, it's a very much a mixed speed economy. But in the content world, there is an interdependence between one and the other, and that's really where the friction lies. So, you know, whilst on the one hand, uh, you know, we talk about, we talk about the multi-sided model yeah, and yeah. the fact that Google um, plays both sides, and I, yeah. so does Facebook. Arguably, Facebook has an easier time of it um, because it doesn't play with any, uh, any content that has rights holders attached to it. It plays with our lives. <laughs> that makes it, uh, you know, a, a, in some respects, a, a very different kind of beast, even though the business model is the same. Um, and the challenge that Google and YouTube have, of course, is the fact that they have to negotiate with and deal with, in some shape or form, legacy rights holders who may or may not be adding very much value. And so, you know, the, the, the question for them is, can they move faster, further up the value chain and start creating their own content that isn't dependent upon rights holders? The question for the rest of us is, is that actually a business model that we want to endorse and support, or is it one that we think in some way undermines uh, you know, aspects of our own economy, particularly given where they're based and, and what happens to us? So, you know, I, I think that the complexity is in there uh, in terms of the, you know, trying to protect value amongst different stakeholders is, is significant. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, the way we feel about Google, I think, is deeply ambivalent, because I think we all recognize incredible value, inventiveness, and creativity of, of around the, the model on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, it actually is increasingly becoming market dominant and crushing the opportunities of, of new UK businesses, for example. Do you want to respond? Uh, I think, with, with I market think market. I've spoken for 10 minutes. I would I will say something at the end. Okay, okay, right. okay. Well, we've got probably time for just a couple of questions from the floor, if anybody would like to make an intervention or ask a question or... Yep, there's one here, maybe a mic. Maybe a mic. There's a mic, I think. Yeah. I'm Shabashim from uh, 
uh, Edinburgh Business School. So as Robin just mentioned, uh, we had a creators, uh, creators project uh, in China. So when I, uh, when we were in uh, in China, we found when we uh, talked to uh, uh, Bat, that's uh, internet companies, and um, actually. What I found, you know, for example, here, when you talk about, uh, Charles, you talk about business model, and uh, the presumption is uh, uh, that individual product has got its uh, fixed value, not fixed value, have a value. But in China, what they did is, um, when we interview, when I, yeah, I interviewed all these bad companies, they said, oh, well, um, most important of these uh, uh, cultural products for us is uh, drawing the volume of the users. That's particularly they are focusing on. So it is not the uh, the products itself that capture the value. It's the capture the people are using them. So because like Alibaba, uh, which got e-business. So the question I'm uh, having always in my mind it is about. Do you think it's the creative culture industry that is different from the others? Because of culture industry, now we see the users and creators almost about the same. They are, you know, even users they are creating, you know, through the, for example, you know, Alibaba creates this kind of a platform. Uh, everyone, if you're interested, you can put your product. Uh, on that platform, and the, and the platform will help you to reach the market. Then you will know whether you have the potential. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yes, please do. No, no, go ahead. Okay. I, I think you. I think it's a wonderful intervention. I think you've hit upon a. a, a you know, it, it's great to hear about the concerns that you have and, and your thoughts about that. I think the thing that you've highlighted, which is really important, is that digital technology has totally transformed the way that customers can engage with each other and transform the way they can engage with firms. And until you know, 20 or 30 years ago, it was very, very difficult for creative firms uh, in the creative industries and outside the creative industries to engage with customers dynamically in any sort of meaningful way and, and get from them what they wanted and, and also to make the creative possibilities. So I think you're absolutely right on what you think. I think what's happening is, by the way, you know, I put up these four business models uh, earlier on. Let's remember that the multi-sided mediated platform is a charity. The middle class are touched on their shoulder to feel guilty about those in need. The middle class is one side, and they give money to the charity to deliver a service to the other side. And don't forget that in the Victorian hospitals, the names of the donors were on the walls of the hospitals for good reason. The first of all was, of course, they wanted their name to be out there. But secondly, more, far more important, the hospitals were in competition with other doctors who complained about these charities taking away their bread because they gave away services for free. The names on the walls were to guarantee that free services were of higher quality than the paid-for services. So the original multi-sided business model had as a key part of its mechanism the fact that free services must be better quality than the, the paid-for services in order that society would be willing to accept that. Now, I think if we also go back to the fact that in the 19th century, you know, industrialized goods sold on a product basis were actually pretty shoddy and often broke down. It wasn't until various innovations in manufacturing, the American manufacturing system that improved the quality that made the product business model really superior to the service business model. So I think we are in the very early stage of the multi-sided Googles and Facebooks. I actually am much more realistic about their life chances. I think they're not going to remain for very long unless they change. And I think that you have highlighted absolutely rightly the challenges that these firms face in order to make themselves last. No, 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 I think, uh, sorry, I've got, do you want to make a well, I, I, was just gonna, I, I was just going to make one, one comment, which I think is really interesting in this, is, is, and it's like, still a slight tangent, but one of the things that we struggle with when we try and talk about um, the, the digital economy yeah. um, is the fact that the, the way that economists measure 
um, the value of businesses is based on their transactional value. And it, when, you, when you look at Google and Facebook in particular, they don't have any transactional value. Their services are, are free, and yet we know that their contribution economically is very significant. So when you look at, for example, ONS figures, they don't show anything to do with the turnover or the contribution that, that companies like Google and Facebook make. And so the reason I'm saying that and pointing to that is because when we think about how we respond to this market situation and to, and to what this means for culture and, and try and advance uh, our thinking and try and move forward, um, if we do so based on the published data and if we try and make arguments based on that, we actually have problems because we're not, we can't actually describe in any of evidence basis uh, the reality of what's going on. And I think that's one of the things that's really fascinating about the, the sort of evolutionary point that we're at, is that, is that not only have we got companies who have got legacy business models trying to compete with new companies that have totally different business models, we've actually got legacy data uh, that doesn't describe properly and we don't have the methodologies to describe the circumstances in which we find ourselves. So, had one over here, a question over here. Oh, yes, this is... Hello. Uh, I'll shout. <laughs> Uh, Michael Collins, director of iPublishing. We're, we're uh, through our creative licensing project. We're a digital catapult case study and a copyright hub use case. But um, while you were talking, you were talking about uh, rock concerts, and I just thought I'd mention, and there is probably a question in there somewhere, that 10 minutes ago on the BBC website, um, the headline Glastonbury Festival has somber opening, gives us a picture of, um, well, Portishead paid tribute to Joe Cox with their version of Abba's SOS quoting her parliamentary maiden speech in the video. Actually, they've misquoted the speech in the video. So look at the complexities of the attributions in there. And actually, the public doesn't care. Um, our complexities, our copyright issues are not their problem. We have to simplify, do we not? I think that was one of the messages that I think you were giving us, yeah. if that is the question. Um, we have to live in the real world, um, and if you're involved in the complexities of copyright and you're engaging with the public, you've got to try and make it simple uh, as you can to keep them honest. Is that right? Um. Uh, I, I think it is, but I think we also have to recognise the, the real complexities that are there. And, the, and you know, the multi-sided market, yes, but there are a lot of stakeholders. There are a lot of, uh, you know, if you think back to the root of, of the creators involved, I, I, that's a brilliant example that you just quoted because obviously it, it, you can't even begin to unravel at this, from this distance who the creative components of that might, you know, might be, let alone who own them. But, but I think, you know, yes, we need to aspire to simplicity, yes, we need to aspire to transparency, but we can't walk away from the realities of the complexity we're actually in. Did you want to make a comment Well, it's, it's just, um, Martin Kretschmer talked a little bit this morning about the asymmetry of the market. I mean, it's extraordinary asymmetry. I mean, and there isn't a shortage of cultural products. There's an infinite supply. Uh, there is intense demand for some cultural products. Uh, and actually, it's interesting to see in China, you know, it's, uh, you, you, you might buy to get early access to a piece of music, which otherwise you can get for free. So it highlights that there's a kind of life cycle to cultural products, and the market's very different, and its interest for different stakeholders is very different. And I think it seems to me when we're thinking about the markets, we think of one market. Actually, there are complex sets of markets that are coming into play and complex kind of trading strategies that might be deployed so the back catalogue you know, can probably be uh, given away for free if you rent, charge a high rent for access to the Hollywood movie or the Rolling Stones blockbuster as it's just come up. So we need to have dynamic rather than static models of this valuation policy and a differentiated model rather than talk about a single market. It's an extraordinarily heterogeneous market. Just a very quick point. I think, you've, I think it's a great in interjection. I think... What, what the digital economy has done is actually completely transformed the lives of many people who are very creative and who never had access to that creative output. They were forced to play the piano to their own family if they would listen or go to the local bar and have beer poured down them and now they can put it on the web and people can listen to them and I think or do whatever it is or write or, or do the many things that dead artists can be celebrated. I think it's just completely opened up the box of the sort of belief of... Uh, on the other hand, you're right, the, the, not the elite, but so much the, the really dedicated artists who spent years 
that, that, that monetizing and rewarding them is going to be a big challenge. And I think you put your finger on exactly that challenge. And I think we have to come up with a better way of doing that. And I have one last question over here. Um, hello. Um, apologies for being late, but I was running straight over from a digital capital um, discussion on trust and privacy. And the overwhelming view of that roundtable is that um, the business models um, of the, some of the companies you've been talking about here are sitting on what was described as an implied consent time bomb, mm -hmm. which I thought was a really nice way of describing the, the, the content creation that's been oiled by people not really caring much about their data rights is about to um, explode. And I wondered what your views were um, of how that would affect the business models you've been discussing and the asymmetry that's emerged during your debate as well. Well, I tell, I, my only thought about that is that, that, that in 2018, um, the European Commission is due to roll out into Europe, whatever that looks like at that point, something called the General Data Privacy Regulation. And that is designed specifically to address that imbalance, particularly on the part of Google and Facebook. And <laughs> sorry to bring it back to where we are, but I suppose the question for the UK is, are we going to get the benefit of that, or are we going to end up being subjected to the imbalance for our lack of our own uh, legislation? Because I suspect our legislative timetable won't have time to come up with something like that in the period between now and then. Which perhaps can make us think about some of Lionel's com uh, comments this morning. Um, one last word, Charles, did you want to, did you want no, no, to say a final sorry, word? Sure okay, well, very sadly, I think we've actually come to the end um, of this session, um, which I think has been really interesting in highlighting some of the excellent work that is really, uh, that's been going on uh, within CREATE. And Charles, thank you very much for drawing some of the, uh, some of the threads together. Um, and I think uh, some really, you know, sort of lovely, lovely questions from the audience as well. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.